we are happy to introduce uh, Chris Bloor. Chris is the president and CEO, CEO at Tayo. Prior to joining the Tayo team in March of 2020, Chris spent 15 years working in politics, political campaigns and communications for the House of Commons in the United Kingdom and was elected four times as a city councillor for his home in West Midlands. We'd also like to welcome Dr. Jessica Ning. Jessica is a public policy professional with over five years experience in policy research analysis and develop in, in addition to her PhD training in social policy at the school, London School of Economics. She brings uh, experience working with political parties and administrations to influence decision makers in Canada. Welcome Jessica and Chris. Thanks Dave. Uh, Thanks so I much think, Dave. I think Caitlin is going to be sharing her screen so that we can see our presentation. Fantastic. Well, first of all, thank you, Dave, uh, for that interjection and for the invitation to be with you. As you've said, I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, uh, Dr. Jessica Ng, who's our uh, Tayo's Director of Policy and Government Affairs, and who's going to be presenting with me today, and Caitlin Drexler, who's our Policy and Research Officer, who has the an enviable task of going through our slides as we go through this. So uh, we're delighted to be here, uh, and we're confident that this is going to be the last time we're at an FEO conference online, and we're excited about that, Dave, but uh, it's been a great start, uh, and congratulations to your team. Um, listen, our industry, we've just heard from, from Melanie and, and the minister previously, but our industry is about bringing people together, experiencing new things. And that's one of the reasons we've been so badly affected by this pandemic. And it, 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 for those of you who haven't heard of the Tourism Industry Association of Ontario, or TAYO as we prefer to be called, don't worry, we're going to explain to, to you about what we do as an organization, but we're also going to talk about why this is such an important time for the tourism industry, especially as we work with government moving forward in this sort of uh, second phase of the pandemic as we move out of restrictions and, and hopefully move into a situation where we're gonna start replicating what happened pre 2020, uh, where our industry was growing uh, so much. And so I'm gonna warn you from the start, you've got, a, you've got a pretty impressive set of speakers and agenda items on FEO's month long conference. We're not marketeers and we're not event creators. We're not the creative ones like you are. We're policymakers and our job is to make sure you have that environment to be creative, hold fantastic events and be successful and bring people back to Ontario. So uh, this is going to be a little bit policy heavy and we apologize for that. But, uh, you know, we're the industry's paid awkward squad as such and we're here to ask difficult questions and give you the tools to flourish. So. Uh, and on that point, I just want to say thank you to many of the people on this call. Uh, you know, listen, we've been uh, stuck in our silos, in our uh, in our offices at home, our home offices, our spare rooms, our living rooms over the last two or so years, and try to bring everyone together that we can speak with one voice and so that we can get our recommendations through government at all levels. And, you know, we've been really successful for, in, in that in many, many ways. And, and we're going to talk about some of the ways we haven't been successful and things we need to improve. But it's really important as an industry, we move forward together. And so... Now, as many of you know, you know, Tuesday was a, a really important day for us in the visitor economy after 716 days of closures, restrictions, and almost constant uncertainty, Ontario lifted the vast majority of its health restrictions and protocols connected to measures designed to reduce transmission of COVID-19. You know, it, it's a merciful end to color coded public health units, roadmaps, and constant fiddling with regulations and having to go on websites to check what you can and can't do uh, from one day to another. And as we come to the end of this pandemic, we're moving away from those challenges, but to an equally set of new demanding challenges and obstacles to bring our industry back to where it was. And for me, perversely, I think this is probably one of the most dangerous times for our industry and the wider visitor economy as we strive to fight against that notion just because we've started to reopen uh, this week, that our industry has, some, has somehow recovered almost immediately when we know that there's a huge amount of challenges that we're going to face to bring people back. And it's why our role at Tayo is just as important in the next coming months and your support uh, to make sure we get the level of support we need. And, you know, it's really clear we have to work together across all the visitor economy uh, to have our voice heard at the top table. We can't revert back to the series of ways where we used to talk on our own. Our collective voice is so much more stronger uh, when we work together than when we work individually. And so, you no, know, listen, 
as a part of that collaboration over the last two years, despite some flaws and some government programs, we've managed to bring in some really effective programs such as the rent subsidies, uh, grants, uh, CBA loans and protections that have helped mitigate, you know, some of the worst consequences of this pandemic. And I think it is a, it is a tribute to innovation and uh, resilience of our industry that so many people have got through these last two years. Listen, we're going to talk about some of the economic scars that we've suffered from, but we've done incredibly well as an industry to get through to this point where we are. So I'll go to the next slide, please, Caitlin. So as we come out of this initial stage of the pandemic, we, we're now thinking about what are the new questions and new challenges that we face. And you know, there's three sort of key questions that at Tyre we're working to answer and with our, our national colleagues, Tyak. And you know, that first question is what type of economic supports will the industry need to recover? You know, this means, you know, how, how long do we need to keep the wage subsidy in place? How long do we need to keep rent subsidies in place? We need continued grants. We need protection against the price gouging in the commercial insurance market that's happening right now. And we need money to flow to agencies such as Destination Ontario and Destination Canada to make sure that we're competing against our competitors internationally to bring people in. You know, quite frankly, we also need a plan in place if we fall back into lockdown, if there is a new uh, a variant that comes uh, in, in, into the health crisis. We have to be, be prepared not to shut down our economy like we have over the last two years. We need a plan in place uh, if we are to get a new strain of COVID. You know, how do we address the ongoing barriers to travel? You know, Melanie spoke about some of the challenges we face on consumer confidence. But one of the things that we're working on quite strongly at the moment is trying to get rid of those obstacles like testing that still remains at the border. And Jess is going to talk a little bit more about that. But trying to create that barrier free uh, traveler experience that will mean that people will go to your events or festivals in Ontario uh, from over the border. And of course, finally, you know, none of this is possible without the staff or the people working within our industry. Uh, and we do face a labor crisis at the moment uh, uh, within the tourism industry and hospitality industry and the visitor economy as a whole. Now that's something, and we're gonna talk about it in our presentation that existed before any of us knew where Wuhan was, but it has been enhanced and made so much worse by the pandemic. And there are some real key challenges that we've got to meet to make sure that we uh, don't find ourselves in a situation not being able to meet the demand of people wanting to travel in Ontario. But now I'm going to pass over to Jess to tell you a little bit more about Tayo if you don't know who we are. Thanks, Chris. So Tayo is the Tourism Ministry's advocacy organization in Ontario. We are a lobbying group. We represent about 200,000 tourism businesses and about 400,000 tourism workers across the province. We are a member of the Tourism Ministry Association of Canada, our national counterpart, TIAC, alongside other provincial and territorial tourism industry associations across the country. We are a member of the Coalition of the Hardest of Businesses. This is a group that formed during the COVID-19 pandemic, and this includes sector associations across Canada's tourism and hospitality industry. Um, you know, in Ontario, as Chris mentioned, um, COVID brought our sectors together. You know, we're not working in silos anymore. Um, and, you know, a lot of this was driven by um, the need for operators, for sector associations to get the latest information um, related to the industry, the public health restrictions, the types of supports there are. Um, and it came under um, us, Tayo. And so there is a real need um, for groups like us to represent the uh, interests of our industry directly to government. And that's where we come in. Next slide, please. And so we've spoken at provincial pre-budget consultations. We meet with and we have regular dialogue with provincial and federal bureaucrats. And so this is um, you know, folks in the tourism portfolio, but also in ministries and departments such as labor, finance, economic development, northern development, and ind indigenous affairs. And we meet with MPPs and MPs of all political stripes. We are nonpartisan. We do collect data from our members um, in order to inform our policy agenda and our advocacy. And, you know, in fact, we began ramping up that data collection at the start of the pandemic to understand, you know, what's the extent of the financial impact of COVID on tourism businesses and organizations, what do they need to recover and how do we relay that to government? And so the data that we've been collecting through our stakeholder consultations, through industry calls and surveys became hugely important to ground our evidence-based policy recommendations that we communicate directly to government. And so um, some of these policy ideas have become um, policy in real life. And so this includes programs such as the Ontario Tourism Recovery Program, the Tourism and Travel Small Business Support Grant, tourism specific wage and rent subsidies so extensions of susan sirs through the current tourism and hospitality recovery program 
amendments to the Employment Standards Act to help operators retain laid off staff. And this has been um, an important component in the meetings and convention sector, um, as well as SEBA, as Chris mentioned. So these are the interest-free, partially forgivable loans that you know, seven in 10 of our, um, of our operators have relied on to remain financially solvent. All right, back to you, Chris. Thanks, Jess. So when we're talking about rebuilding, it's really important for us to ensure that we remind uh, elected officials and decision makers how big the tourism industry is and was before the pandemic. Now, you're probably thinking, Chris, after two years, how on earth would no any elected official not understand how important the tourism and business economy is? Uh, industry to our economy now absolutely and you've heard from minister mcleod who's been a fantastic advocate uh, from us earlier on the uh, earlier this morning um, you know people uh, now understand uh, minister mcleod has been one of those important people in explaining to the rest of the cabinet and explaining to other mpps to explain to the federal government that you really can't have an economic recovery unless our industry recovers and this is one of the biggest challenges that we faced during this pandemic is that there have been so many different priorities for the government to deal with during the pandemic. It's fighting a health crisis, but also the collapse of the virtually the entire economy. And, and so making sure that we've had our voice heard at the top table has been really important. And to do that, we've had to really uh, educate as many people as we can about the size of our industry. And you'll see from uh, from this initial slide that, you know, these are the statistics that you've heard many, many times before about, you know, our 36 or 38 billion GDP uh, contribution in Ontario that we, you know, we return over $5 billion in, in, in tax contributions to Queen's Park, which is money that's going to be desperately needed as we try to pay back some of the debts and the deficits that we've had or incurred over the last two years. And, you know, one of the things that's really important for us moving forward is that we keep this conversation about the size of our industry going and the importance of it, because we really don't believe we can have a recovery uh, without the visitor economy. And any of you who, you know, listen, I live in downtown Toronto, uh, and over the last two years, the damage that's been done to that, the downtown core, the downtown economy, because of the loss of the visitor economy, whether it's business events disappearing, whether it's festivals uh, disappearing, whether it's sporting events being cancelled, or whether it's just the general tourism operators not being able to operate, it has been enormous and it has been uh, so severe to see how many businesses have been had to close down because they just don't have the footfall that's available to them and of course you know in our regional economies and urban uh, environments too um, rural environments you know tourism has replaced uh, uh, and, and big festivals and events have, have replaced, uh, you know, former manufacturing sites or, or, or traditional economies that have become the linchpin of their local economies. And we've already heard of examples where in Ontario, you know, uh, projects, capital projects, community infrastructure projects have been cancelled because there isn't uh, there isn't the hope that an event will be happening for two or three years, that tourism numbers have gone down. So, you know, the tourism economy isn't just important to those who work within it or in festivals and events. We're part of this uh, multi, uh, you know, adjacent ecosystem of events and, 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 and economies that rely on people that we bring into Ontario uh, uh, to thrive. And so that's really important for us to keep saying that to elected officials and decision makers throughout this process. Can we go to the next slide, Caitlin? So, you know, we've talked about how big the industry was before the pandemic and of course listen you can't shut down an industry for two years and not have really significant damage done to the industry and you know we have been very fortunate and i apologize to many of you who get toy emails with the amount of surveys that we've bombarded with you you with over the last two years but that data has gone straight to provincial government uh, decision makers and federal government decision makers to give them a clear indication about what's been happening on the ground and i'm convinced if it wasn't for the fact that we had that evidence generation strategy in place at the beginning of this process we wouldn't have been able to secure the supports that we have them because you know some of the numbers that we've been talking about of what's happened have been really stark and you know you can see from the slide uh, that over 60 percent of our members have reported at one time uh, or, or, or multiple multiple times during the year the last two years a 90 percent loss uh, of revenue and in Northern Ontario, that got even higher. Some of our businesses were reporting 93% revenue losses for an entire year, which is just extraordinary that, to think that so many of these businesses have made it through. And of course, you know, at the start of this year, uh, when we uh, had a small regression uh, as Omicron started to uh, really cut through the population, uh, you know, we had some really uh, scary numbers on cancellations again, and people felt really concerned about whether there was any light at the end of the tunnel, despite uh, vaccination rates uh, 
uh, increasing and, 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 and it's doing so much work to reduce transmission. And, you know, I think it's really important to say that, um, you know, this isn't uh, the fault of our industry. You know, our products that we have on offer, the festivals, the events, the tourism operators, the, the, the things that we have on offer uh, in Ontario are incredibly popular. They're, they're world leaders. You know, we're world renowned. It is simply because of the health restrictions that have been put in place, the restrictions of movement that you have not been able to uh, operate, that you have not been able to uh, bring that prosperity to the province. And so uh, I have full confidence, uh, despite the, uh, the some uh, uh, low consumer confidence numbers that, that we're going to be able to get back to uh, where we were pre uh, pandemic but it's really important to remember that uh, we're taught uh, from our survey at one stage 81 percent of our members were relying on at least one government economic program uh, to survive the pandemic and over 70 percent of our members said if they hadn't been able to to, to use those or, or, or source those economic supports they would have closed without it so uh, next slide please caitlin so you know what are the scars? What are the economic scars of what happens when you don't have revenue? Like, you know, for some businesses, and mercifully, it, it's been a small number. Some have closed, some people have sold up and they've decided to take early retirement or, 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 or decided to close and, and go to a different industry. But one of the big problems that, you know, many businesses have, have taken on is, is pretty large amounts of debt. And it's, you know, when you've got fixed costs like salaries that still pay out if you're a seasonal business, or when you've got the rising costs of just doing business right now, uh, you know, rising fuel costs, uh, you know, it's really difficult to decide what you're going to do. And for many of those of you who have stayed, continued, uh, continue to operate, many of you taken on really large amounts of debt and, 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 and not just that, you know, private or commercial sources, but some of the government programs have been adding on to those debt piles that many businesses uh, uh, have taken on in Ontario. And you can see the statistic of the size of the debt that many of the businesses we work with have taken on. So, you know, that's just, you know, despite the success of crafting programs such as the wage subsidy and the rent subsidy and other programs, you know, some of the programs that we've helped uh, build or, or, or called for haven't actually met the, the needs of this very diverse industry that we work in. Uh, and I think Jess is gonna talk about some of them now. Thanks, Chris. Um, you know, absolutely. You know, our tourism businesses would not have survived the pandemic without government support. And these COVID relief programs have been so important to their financial solvency. But there's a lot that could be improved about these programs and about any future such programs to meet industry needs. And so, you know, the biggest thing is that eligibility criteria gaps have excluded a number of businesses from that critical support. So on the federal end, you know, the Tourism Relief Fund, there is a requirement for businesses to be incorporated in order to apply. And the problem is this excludes sole proprietors, it excludes partnerships, which are legitimate business entities. It's a problem across Ontario that we've heard, um, but it's especially it's a problem in Northern Ontario where unincorporated businesses make up to 60% of our tourism operators. And it's down to the legal advice that Northern operators have received. It's just reflective of the different type of legal and financial advice that urban versus rural businesses tend to receive due to the different operating contexts. And in this case, it happens to exclude them from key financial programs that they, they really do require. Um, there is the Tourism and Hostility Recovery Program right now. So the seasonality issue um, is still there. It's not been addressed from previous Seuss and Sirs uh, wage and rent subsidies. So um, in this case, seasonal businesses cannot fully benefit from it. They cannot apply for periods in which they were not operating due to seasonality. And the problem is, um, you know, operating expenses continue to pile up, continue to uh, be in place, even though they're not operational for customers. Um, and they're supposed to, you know, generate enough revenue during their operating season to sustain them in the off season. But it's been extraordinarily difficult to do that during COVID. Um, as Chris mentioned, in you know, in the north, for instance, we've had businesses, seasonal businesses, had those revenue losses of ninety percent or more. And so, when you have that revenue loss, it's extremely difficult to get, you know, enough revenue to sustain you in the off season. Even more difficult when you can't access the wage and rent subsidies that you need uh, to sustain that and supplement that. Um, you know, there's also a 40% current month and 12 month revenue uh, loss threshold in the THRP. And so the 40% revenue loss uh, penalizes businesses for recovering in the month that they're applying in. Um, so it excludes any business that has a revenue loss that is not 40% or more. Um, their 12 month average revenue loss, it assumes that businesses are generating relatively consistent income uh, over the course of the year, um, but that's not what we've seen during COVID. 
where, you know, due to the evolving reopening and closing measures, there's um, often periods of really drastic revenue loss and other periods of relatively good revenue. And that's not reflected in this program. Next slide, please. And so, you know, on the provincial end, um, we've seen something similar. So with the um, Ontario Tourism Recovery Program, there was a requirement, um, again, similar to the um, Tourism Relief Fund, that businesses be incorporated. Again, excluding sole proprietors, excluding partnerships. Um, the other aspect is, you know, um, businesses must have issued a T4 to an employee. This is a problem for a lot of sole proprietors um, and a lot of businesses that employ through contracting arrangements, such as seasonal businesses. For the Ontario Tourism and Travel Small Business Support Grant and the Small Business Support Grant, these have been mutually exclusive programs. So the business eligibility is mutually exclusive. So if you were eligible for the Small Business Support Grant, you are not eligible for the Tourism and Travel Small Business Support Grant. The problem is not just that if you receive one, you could not receive the other. What we've heard from businesses then in some cases, they didn't know how long the pandemic would last. And so when they were eligible for the small business support grant, they did not need that financial support. So they preferred to just not apply to let other folks um, have the grant support. Um, by the time that they did need the support and the tourism and travel grant um, became available, um, they were not eligible and they could not apply. And so they lost out on that. And just overall, what we've seen is that tourism and hospitality sector breakdown that's used in a lot of these government supports um, did not account for the diversity of the industry. So, for instance, privately owned commercial hotel units have been excluded from the tourism and travel small business support grant in Ontario. So these are arrangements where the individual hotel unit um, in the entire hotel is owned by a tourism operator. And it's common in resort communities like Blue Mountain. And so in Blue Mountain alone, we had 1,300 owners of these commercial hotel units who could not apply for the Tourism and Travel Small Business Support Grant because they were erroneously lumped in with Airbnbs. You know, in other cases, there is just a lack of understanding of how diverse the industry is. And so some jobs are included because, you know, there is a general understanding of those and other jobs were not. So, you know, for instance, everyone knows what an event planner does, but not many people outside the festival and event sector know what an event designer does. And as a result, event designers have often been excluded um, and just fallen through the cracks of these eligibility. Um, and so in the end, you know, what could be improved for current and future funding programs moving forward, it's, you know, starting from a framework that reflects the realities of tourism businesses and organizations in Ontario. Uh, one that reflects their financial and legal structure, the diversity of occupations and sectors in the industry, and the pace of recovery um, that's, you know, ongoing right now. And it means more industry consultations with groups like TIO and with other sector associations to ensure that financial supports do meet the needs of tourism businesses that they're intended to support. And I'll just pass back to Chris to talk about the lasting economic impacts of COVID. Yeah, thanks, Jess. So obviously, listen, we've talked about debt. We've talked about the challenges that we face to uh, get our industry uh, back up and running. And the fact that just because we've uh, started to reopen, uh, that that doesn't mean uh, that we are fine and dandy and everything is sorted and, and, and it's all uh, plain sailing from now on. And, you know, we've talked about uh, some of the things that we uh, need to do to ensure that our industry is in the best position to reap the rewards of, of reopening at a steady pace, but also you know, being able to welcome back international travellers to the levels that we uh, need them to be, because uh, we're currently, you know, obviously miles off the uh, level of international travellers that we need to sustain our industry. And so, you know, there are some really big challenges that we face. And, you know, it, what's really crucial about this is Destination Calendar has released uh, a lot of data and information about how long they think uh, our recovery will take uh, to, to get through. And, you know, some people are predicting up to four years for us to get to pre-COVID levels of, of economic activity. And But with the right economic support, with the right decisions on marketing, on communications, um, on giving people the opportunity to get uh, uh, ramped up as quickly as possible, we could steal a march on our competitors across the world. Um, next slide, Caitlin. 
So what does that mean? That means making changes to recovery programs and programs uh, now. And, you know, I, uh, you know, I saw some of the people on the call today, and I know many of you are part of those groups that haven't been able to take advantage of some of the programs that have been created by the federal government, especially. And that's one of the biggest frustrations I've had over the last two years is that despite so much of our work to try and educate uh, uh, de uh, decision makers and, and politicians, that they've still not quite understood the diversity of our industry and you know how you know you know this how some of the uh, programs the way in which that they've been created in terms of eligibility criteria and how that people are, are requested to show losses or revenue losses they don't actually match up with the way in which our industry works and that's really really frustrating for me but in addition to what's on your screen right now and you know there, there are some new emerging problems that I think could affect the way in which we uh, are able to rebound and recover. And, you know, a couple of those things are on the level of debt that we've spoken about. We need to, you know, we need to make the bold decision to write off some of the debt, some of the CBA loans uh, that we've given uh, that, that people have been able to uh, apply for during this period. The government you know, shouldn't be making money uh, off individuals who have had to close or not be able to do business because of government decisions. You know, we've all made sacrifices per, per personal and professional during this process, but we can't penalize uh, businesses that are trying to ramp up uh, by, by having that millstone of debt around them. So that's something that we're campaigning for quite strongly. Um, but we also need to understand that, you know, we have a big issue about commercial insurance in this uh, province and in this country as a whole, you know, and we really need to follow the lead of other countries such as the United Kingdom, who are putting in some uh, really successful programs right now to uh, protect festival event owners to uh, on their insurance premiums to ensure that they're not paying through the nose to be able to do the same uh, event uh, or festival that they've done before the pandemic. We need to make sure that, uh, you know, commercial uh, premiums uh, cover the same level uh, of, of standard that they did before the pandemic. We can't allow insurance companies uh, to lower uh, coverage levels but rise premium levels you know these are things that we really need to get a hold of and we need to follow the example of Britain and Western Europe countries who are uh, putting in uh, programs that protect uh, deposit schemes uh, for, for people or for artists that you may be hiring uh, to ensure that you can actually get people to uh, commit to come to a festival event because they know they're going to get paid uh, even if there is a, a health crisis or, or, or a rollback you know uh, programs that uh, you know um, subsidized ticket pricing and also uh, have emergency protocols in place that cover the costs of having to cancel events at the last minute. There are some really uh, innovative schemes that are going on right now in the West End in the UK that we could be doing in Ontario and we could be doing Canada wide to give people the confidence to be able to have those events uh, in place right now. And of course, you know, lastly, you know, things like Reconnect Festival and funding and programs like that. Let's get the um, Let's get the uh, the dates for applying and, and the dates for, for hearing when you're going to get some uh, resources changed to actually give the ability to be able to plan uh, to move forward and to be able to, uh, to, to make decisions on stakeholders and vendors at the right time. And so those are some of the things that we really are pushing for right now. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that I think this is a really dangerous time for the industry. We can't allow governments uh, at any level to think that they've uh, they've solved the issue of the visitor economy or the tourism industry or festivals and events. We need these programs to continue throughout this year. If we can ensure that our industry is protected through this initial recovery period, we will reap the rewards in 2023 and 2024. It would be a tragedy if we got through these two years with the sacrifices that we've all made to only lose key festivals and events and businesses now at the final hurdles. So um, I'll pass back to Jess. Thanks, Chris. And so, you know, related to that, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges going forward, you know, in our recovery are the continuing barriers to travel um, and what we need to overcome these to get our visitors back, to get our um, tourism recovery back on track um, and fast forward. And so, um, you know, COVID restrictions have damaged Ontario's brand for travel. Um, you know, we know that over the course of the pandemic, there has been a dominant narrative that it's just not safe to travel. And public health restrictions um, at the provincial level have driven this narrative. Federal border restrictions have played into this narrative. And the media has also played into it as well with, um, you know, the sometimes sensationalized reporting during the pandemic. And so, you know, federal border restrictions have, you know, additionally created the perception that traveling to Ontario is just too confusing and it's too costly. 
the border measures have evolved over the course of the pandemic. The language on the government website, it's not always clear. It's not always you know, up to date when it needs to be. And so it's hard for visitors, for operators, for Canadian residents to keep up with this. And so you know, in some cases, travelers have been wrongly denied boarding for their flights into Canada. Another issue that's been um, that's been an issue is, you know, the requirement to obtain a pre arrival test, which has been, you know, financially costly for individuals and for families. PCR tests for travel run upwards of $200 per person per test. And this is a cost that's compounded for families and it's made travel into Canada inaccessible for a lot of people. The quarantine requirements have been financially costly as well. And altogether, it's made it financially prohibitive for families to travel, but especially families with young children to travel. Next slide, please. And the pandemic has also changed the way people gather. So with business events, for instance, there is a preference now for gathering virtually that we're doing a hybrid event that wasn't there before. You know, you no longer need to fly in to participate. You can do so from the comfort of your own home. You can save on the conference expenses. This is an attractive option for attendees who don't have the budget for these types of expenses or who want to attend but are sustainability conscious and who don't want to add to the carbon footprint. And this is something that we're seeing a lot more in the conference world. And so when holding hybrid events, you can reach these markets that you, you might not have been able to reach before. Um, hybrid events, however, are expensive, especially for mid-sized operators who don't have the capital to put on a high quality hybrid event. And with the financial impacts of the pandemic, business events you know, yet to return and the changing visitor dynamics, the competitiveness of meeting and convention hubs like Toronto and Ottawa are at risk of falling behind other North American hubs. And with this new preference for hybrid events moving forward, mid-sized operators and mid-sized municipalities will be priced out of competition. Next slide, please. So what do we need to remove travel barriers? We need to remove border restrictions first and foremost. The PCR test is, you know, as of February 28th, this Monday, um, or this past Monday, PCR test is no longer required to enter Canada, but the requirement to obtain a rapid test administered by a healthcare professional still presents barriers to travel. The rapid test must be taken no more than 24 hours before travel, but this is not doable for people who cannot easily access a lab or a pharmacy that is performing these validated rapid tests. Um, it also just depends on when you can get an appointment to get that rapid test taken. There might not be an appointment available in that 24 hour window. And you know, not only that, there's been some confusion around the official government guidance of the rapid test requirement. And so as a result, travelers are in some cases opting to you know, still continue forward with that more expensive PCR test you know, because of um, greater certainty around uh, the validity of the results and when they can get that appointment. And so Tayo is pushing for you know, the removal of all testing requirements for fully vaccinated travelers um, because these make travel more difficult and they turn visitors off from coming into Canada and from coming to Ontario. And so if we're looking to have travel return, we need to remove these travel barriers. And another barrier that we haven't talked about a lot is, you know, the barrier facing unvaccinated travelers. When will they be allowed back to the country for leisure travel and under what conditions? This is a conversation that you know, does um, need to happen. Next slide, please. You know, we also need support on the government end. We need to change the narrative around travel and we need to rebuild our brand. And for that, we need government communications campaigns. We need to emphasize that Ontario is open for business for both leisure visitors and business, business events and travelers. You know, it's time to explore Ontario. It's time to rediscover Ontario. And this is a message that should be directed to Ontario residents, to Canadian visitors and international visitors. And if we're sticking with concepts like safe travel, you know, we need to emphasize that travel in Ontario is safe travel because when our tourism operators are certi certified with the safe travel stamp, we know they're following the highest standards of public health and safety set out by the World Travel and Tourism Council. And as Chris mentioned, you know, we do need action 
on high commercial insurance rates. Um, this matters absolutely for our recovery, for um, you know, reducing those barriers to travel. And so a number of operators have said that you know, their business survived the pandemic only to be taken down by commercial insurance premiums. You know, on average, we're seeing you know, commercial insurance premium increases of 30%, even for businesses you know, with good records who have never made a claim. Um, we had one operator in Northern Ontario come to us with an insurance premium quote that was a 400% increase from their pre-COVID rates. And so, you know, with the pace of recovering moving slow, with debt to pay off, this is an added expense that tourism businesses cannot afford right now. And, you know, if operators cannot afford their commercial insurance premiums, or if their coverage is reduced and it doesn't, you know, um, fully provide coverage for all aspects of the visitor experience for that operator, the capacity for tourism operators to offer those high quality visitor experiences is at risk. And it hurts tourism businesses, it hurts our brand, and it deters visitors from coming here. Next slide, please. And so of course we need more funding. Um, you know, Destination Ontario and Destination Canada require additional government funding to get Canadian and international visitors back to Ontario, to bring business events back to Ontario, to encourage Ontarians to explore their province. We need more funding for destination marketing organizations to work with suppliers. Um, you know, we need more funding also directed to operators directly so they can have those marketing dollars to reach their new customers and existing customers. And, you know, given the cost of hybrid events for mid-sized municipalities, mid-sized operators, we need a hybrid events um, funding to, you know, help these operators um, get those um, meeting conventions and events back to uh, these mid-sized municipalities so they can remain competitive domestically and internationally and get visitors back. You know, there's also a role for the media to play in raising the profile of Ontario's tourism industry. Um, the media so far, um, you know, over the course of the pandemic has played a role in driving a narrative that's not safe to travel. Um, there's an opportunity moving forward to elevate media stories that raise the profile of our industry and what Ontario has to offer local Canadian and international visitors. There's an opportunity here for media to collaborate with destination marketing organizations on this. Next slide, please. And so, you know, in order to rebuild consumer confidence, um, you know, again, we need those communications campaigns supporting the narrative of safe travel, that it's safe to travel. We need greater investment in rapid tests as well. This is something we've heard from tourism operators, from sector associations, and um, there's a need for rapid tests for tour operators, for tour guides and participants, and especially for meeting and event attendees, not just the employees who are on site. So currently rapid tests that are available to businesses through the province are available only for employee use, but it leaves out attendees of events um, and conventions. And so for business events where you have people congregating for extended periods of time, it just makes sense to have rapid tests there for peace of mind. These are events also where people tend to be flying in and traveling in um, on trains from regions across the province, across Canada, internationally. And so again, it just makes sense to have rapid tests available to prevent transmission to others when they're returning home on those transportation routes. We also need greater investment in rapid tests for the general public. Rapid tests are so important in preventing community and workplace transmission. But if you don't work in a high risk setting that requires you to be on site, it's been extremely difficult getting access to free rapid test kits. So right now the province's distribution of take home rapid test kits, it's been time limited. There's been distribution you know, through um, malls, through select grocery stores and pharmacies right now. But because these test kits have not been made available on a regular basis over the course of the pandemic, these, are, these tests have been running out within the hour that retailers have been distributing them at grocery stores and pharmacies. And so if we want consumers to feel safe in tourism and hospitality settings, if we want them to come back and indoors, we need to make sure that they have those test kits when they need them just in case. Next slide, please. 
And so as an industry, we also need to talk about accommodating patrons who are still cautious, especially with the lifting of restrictions like capacity limits, like proof of vaccination, and um, later down the road when, when masking is also lifted. And these accommodations can include, you know, operators openly discussing and clearly communicating um, the increased frequency of cleaning indoor settings, the measures that they're taking to keep everyone safe. It includes incentivizing venues um, to upgrade their air filtration systems, to improve outdoor venues, um, and ensuring you know, an enhanced comfortable experience. And it also includes providing other accommodations and being a little creative um, in this way. So, you know, for instance, um, you know, delivery and takeout options have expanded during lockdown. Maybe we need to, you know, continue extending these on an ongoing basis to continue reaching people who aren't yet comfortable going into those indoor settings. Um, you know, we've had pre prepackaged food options during um, COVID and contactless options, we might need to you know, think about continuing these for consumers um, so that they, they can obtain their purchases, but also you know, just generally contactless options that let you reach your consumers without having them, uh, without, you know, them having to go to your physical location. And you know, an interesting idea for meeting event spaces is having designated seating areas with more space between tables. So this is an idea that I saw at um, TIAC's uh, conference last fall, where they had color-coded spaces within the meeting room. So one side for those who preferred more physical distancing. And so the tables were spaced out more, the seating was spaced out more. And then they had color-coded badges, um, you know, for each delegate communicating what their preferred uh, level of personal space was and whether or not, you know, they wanted a hug or to shake hands and whatnot. And so this is something that, you know, I think we can take forward to boost consumer confidence and something that, you know, we might uh, want to see more of in, in the months and years to come. And so, um, Chris, I'll just pass it back to you to address the labor crisis. Thanks, Jess. And this is the uh, final pillar or the final question that we talked about at the beginning about uh, things that we're trying to do to ensure that our recovery is efficient and effective. Uh, and for those of you who, uh, uh, you know, have been involved in our industry for some time, you'll know that this is an, an issue that is new to us as an industry. It's something uh, that we were struggling with to uh, fill vacancies in many different individual sectors uh, of our industry within the visitor economy. And, you know, uh, before any of us knew where uh, Wuhan was or understood uh, what COVID-19 was, um, you know, we were uh, not filling one in 10 uh, tourism jobs uh, in this country uh, across the nation and in Ontario ourselves it, it was predicted that we would be not filling 80,000 jobs uh, within the province and so that meant we were leaving billions of dollars uh, on the table that was lost from our economy and, and opportunities for further growth and so there were several reasons of why we were experiencing such high vacancy rates or uh, uh, businesses were struggling so much to, to fill the vacancies as you know, there are a lot of myths uh, that are associated with our industry about you know being a short term career move or it's a career work in our industry for uh, for, for just young people or that our industry uh, is low skilled uh, or low paid and you know many of those myths you know, you know form a reputation that it's been really difficult for us to be able to attract people to come and work within our industry and so you know in addition to those reputational challenges there are some real you know systematic barriers for people working within uh, the visitor economy, you know, the cost of housing uh, to live near where you work or poor transport links have made it really difficult for many people to enter the tourism industry workforce. And so all of those problems were existing before the pandemic. But of course, as we go to the next slide, Caitlin, um, those issues uh, were enhanced so uh, so extremely and severely and made so significantly worse during the pandemic because you know we, we were effectively shut down uh, in March 2000. Uh, you know, many people were sent home, businesses had zero revenues to be able to keep people on, you know, and at the peak of the pandemic, uh, during the most severe of the lockdown, uh, it was estimated by, and this is a government figure, that we'd lost over 140,000 jobs uh, during that process. And of course, you know, these are people who've got to pay their rent, they've got to pay their mortgages, uh, they've got to uh, buy uh, clothes for their children, whatever they've got, that they've got to do, you know, they simply weren't able to sort of sit on their hands and and, and, and wait for this to be over. They went and looked for other jobs in other sectors. And that's one of the big problems that we've, uh, that we've faced 
uh, right now is that we've lost people. We've, we've lost people to other sectors. We've lost people to the health sectors and other industries. And, and, and getting those people back is going to be really important for us if we are really going to be able to reap the rewards of a recovery moving forward. And so if we go to our next slide, uh, this is, you know, the issue of, the, of, of labor is one of the things that is dominating the work of, of, of many uh, of us involved in the tourism industry right now. Uh, it's one of the things that is being sit, looked at at, at at a federal level and a provincial level about workforce strategies. And you can see from some of the strategies that are on the slide, some of the things that aren't going really uh, going on right now as we speak, you know, we're working with organizations like OTEC and ITO to do uh, job matching events and get indigenous uh, perspective employees into uh, tourism businesses. Um, you know, there are uh, job matching uh, 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 works uh, going on right now to try and get people and attract people back into the industry, you know, especially with the recent uh, uh, minimum wage increases. There are some of those myths that have now been uh, really dealt with and, 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 and dispelled. And so there are lots of short term things that are going on right now to try and entice people back. But of course, you know, what we really need is a long term strategy to encourage more people to consider tourism or working in events or working in the creative industries as a as a successful and as a long term career. And that means, you know, we're very passionate about getting into schools to affect and change the curriculums to give uh, young people the opportunity to see our industry, to see the types of jobs you can do, to see how creative you can be and how successful you can be and really give them the opportunity to get involved in our industry and our businesses at a much earlier age, much like much like the way that apprenticeships have been working or the recent work on skills uh, on, on schools and trade work uh, that Minister McNaughton at MLTSD is really focusing on. We want the same attention to come working within our industry. And of course, in addition to that, we also need to talk about immigration systems and immigration pathways, uh, pathways to permanent residency for, 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 for workers who want to work with our industry. Uh, they've been the backbone for our industry, but after a couple of years uh, might have to return home or don't have a, a, an adequate work visa to be able to stay and, and, and support our industry. And so, you know, there are some short term challenges that we're working on right now to meet that need, but we're really going to need to start changing the way that our industry is perceived in the general workforce to be to be able to really consistently bring in a conveyor belt of employees at all levels at entry levels and at executive levels to make our industry successful and you know one of the things that you know really concerns me is how many people are telling me right now you know they're so excited that they have, can ditch the capacity limits they're excited at the fact that we're getting to the stage where borders may be fully open um, but they don't have the staff to fully open their businesses seven days a week to bring those revenues in that they desperately need. So this is a huge challenge for us and, and something that uh, we're working very strongly and hard on. So uh, final slide, Caitlin, can you bring it on? So we're gonna split this up between me and Jess, uh, but you know, listen, we say reopening doesn't mean recovery and we mean that. You know, we know uh, that you know, we, this is gonna take a significant time for our industry to uh, be able to bring in revenues just to be able to ramp up to uh, full uh, capacity, uh, to be able to get yourself on a, uh, on, on a level playing field, to, to really get ourselves going again. And that's gonna take time. And as exciting as the lifting of capacity restrictions have been and the removal of, pro, of, of health protocols, which is a huge deal and, and it's a, a momentous uh, week for us all, we have really got to get some really key messages across the government during this period. You've heard me talk about the fact that we need a plan if the pandemic uh, means that we have to reinforce or, or restart uh, capacity restrictions. We can't have that situation where we're waiting for the government to come to an idea or a solution to get money in your pockets. And if they do, and if we do have to have further economic supports, we need to learn the lessons that we've talked about. I'm, I'm ensuring that those economic supports are available for all businesses and individuals involved in our diverse industry. We can't have this situation where some businesses that have been very successful, some sole proprietorships or, or, or the unincorporated businesses are left to fight for themselves because they haven't been included in the eligibility criteria. That's so important for us moving forward. We need equal treatment for our sector with others. Listen, 
one of the, uh, you know, there are going to be many inquiries about how the pandemic was dealt with. There were going to be many uh, academic studies about how we dealt with this pandemic. But we also, in the meantime, need to be sure that if we do uh, regress for any reason, that we have parity in the way in which our industry is treated with others. It still doesn't sit right with me that we couldn't have hold an, we couldn't hold a socially distanced event or, 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 or a socially distant tour was at the same time you could go to your local mall with thousands of people and, and roll into shops uh, and spend money. Listen, I'm not against retail being open, but I think we need parity between the way in which our industries are treated. And I think that's so important, especially when you look at the transmission rates that are published by the government of where transmission was happening. It wasn't happening in travel and tourism. It wasn't happening in events. It wasn't happening in the industries that we represent. And the work that so many of the businesses and individuals did on this call to make it safe uh, uh, within the tourism and travel industry, it still makes me really quite angry uh, that many of you were forced to close or cancel events uh, whilst uh, some industries were allowed to stay open. We have an election coming up in June. We're going to be producing a micro website, some educational briefings and tools so that people can get in touch uh, with their local MPP running for re-election or their opponents and the candidates standing in your riding to make sure that when they're elected or re-elected and they go to Queen's Park, the tourism industry and the visitor economy and festival events needs to be top of mind for them in, 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 through economic supports like we talked about, but also understanding the size of our industry and how important it is to our recovery. And finally, you know, uh, I remember uh, when I joined uh, Tayo, I joined Tayo a week before this crisis, so I apologize. Uh, I joined the tourism industry just as it started to collapse. Um, but what I've seen is the change in the way in which our industry is treated by senior politicians and the way in which our recommendations, the way in which we are included in economic dis discussions has changed. We have a seat at the table now. Uh, we, uh, uh, in the last budget, in the provincial budget, there were over 50 mentions of the tourism industry, whereas in previous years there had been one or two perhaps. We have to keep that momentum going. We have to give Minister McLeod the support around the cabinet table when she's fighting uh, for resources with her colleagues from other departments to make sure that this government or a new government understands how important the tourism industry is uh, to our prosperity as a province. Um, and I'll just pass over to Jess to finish. Thanks, Chris. And absolutely. And so, um, you know, moving forward, you know, beyond the upcoming provincial election, beyond um, COVID, we're going to continue advocating for measures that support the immediate and long term recovery of our industry of festivals and events in Ontario. And this includes organizers, operators and suppliers of events and festivals, um, measures that support the sustainability of the industry in this province and measures that insulate the festivals and events sector, the tourism industry as a whole from from the economic impacts of any future extreme events or any future, um, you know, COVID strains. Our rationale, the government for continued funding um, moving forward is threefold. It's about recovery. It's about long-term sustainability of the industry, but it's also about investing in us now so that we can avoid a repeat of the catastrophic financial impacts of COVID that we've seen over the last two years. Chris? Thanks, Jess. That's it, Dave. Uh, we've talked policy for a good 54 minutes. I hope we've uh, not bored people too often, but, you know, we'll just finish off by saying, uh, you know, we've asked a lot of people on this call, uh, you know, I can see Carl and yourself and Dave, how many times have we uh, got you into meetings with government officials and uh, members of the opposition and federal provincial levels uh, to, to, to really get across what's happening with the industry. And uh, I just want to thank you personally and everybody else on this call uh, for whether it's filling in uh, surveys, all this work that we've done over the last two years, whilst also trying to uh, get through this crisis, it's been hugely appreciated. And uh, we really do hope uh, that when uh, next year's conference happens, we can talk about the things that we used to talk about, like Todd signage and small regulatory changes and that you guys are doing what you do best, which is bringing people to the province for fantastic festivals and events. Well, Chris and, and uh, Jessica, thank you very much for everything you brought. And, and Chris, I, I can't help but think back to the first time I met you was uh, in Mississauga. I think you had just started and Beth uh, had invited a, a number of sector groups to hear the minister speak. And, and, you know, we were all so happy at that time. And, you know, there's lots of times with ministries and politicians that you want to scream at the top of your lungs and pull all of your hair out. Um, and, you know, the one thing Minister McLeod, I think, has really done, and, and I think it's through some of the work that Beth and yourselves have done, is 
she's really brought that ministry together that it does has a, have a sound financial backing and you know it, it really is one of the bigger players in the government and for so many years prior to that it had almost been you know when there was a cabinet shuffle or change it's like oh somebody else got thrown into that they're being punished and and i think minister mcleod did a great job of repositioning that whole task that whole uh, group to tell the story that, hey, listen, guys, it's not a throwaway. It is a real substantial part of our economy. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Dave. Just to say, uh, you know, this is it's, it, it. We're constantly asking for more, David, right? We're constantly saying we need more. We need more support. And one of the things that I really want to uh, put on record is our thanks to uh, Minister McLeod and her team, but because uh, they've kept, uh, they've kept, um, they've kept up, they've kept answering the calls, they've kept replying to the emails, and they've kept listening and taking the data when we've given to them. And that's all we can ask for, right? And uh, you know, I think we've seen the elevation of our industry within economic discussion and that's really important and that's something that we've got to maintain moving forward and and that's the other thing i and you touched on it you know we we sent out a lot of survey requests but we were very tactical how we did it at festival and events ontario and we chose our partners carefully so that we weren't bombarding you because there were so many people that wanted inclusions on different topics and stuff like that and our our I think our goals and everything are well aligned with Tayo and, and the other sector groups that were in there. I think one of the other important things to mention is, you know, just because we haven't had wins and, and you know, I think back to our discussion um, earlier with the minister and, and, you know, some issues we've had with our suppliers and it's not for lack of us bringing it up at the table. It's just it's just choices made at at the political side that, you know, we really are working hard behind the scenes to get those loopholes and the folds filled in between. And I'm sure you hear that just as much as I do on, well, why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you do that? And it's not that we didn't, it's just that we haven't experienced those wins just yet. Yeah, I think that's that's a great that's a great point, Dave. Uh, you know, we talked about some of the wins. Jess, you know, who you know uh, has been incredible since she uh, joined the organisation last year in uh, getting changes to some of these programmes and and getting people uh, a, a grant uh, when they've been previously uh, denied for uh, scurrilous reasons. But you're absolutely right. Listen, we haven't won every battle, and it breaks my heart. And this is one of the reasons why when we do these presentations, me and Jess don't roll through the achievements as if uh, you know we've done everything that we wanted to achieve you know it breaks uh, us every time we speak to an, uh, uh, an operator who hasn't been able to get any sort of support during this process because that means that we haven't uh, achieved everything we needed to achieve and uh, you know I, I think uh, this has been hugely uh, personally and professionally uh, uh, challenging for us all uh, but we have to keep going and, and and I joked at the start of this that we're the awkward squad and we're the people that ask difficult questions you know and sometimes you know as fantastic as the minister has been or our, uh, the federal counterpart we have to keep going back and asking for more and that's what I hope that people who've listened today to, to me and Jessica will know that you know Jessica is our director of policy and government affairs she's constantly putting new ways uh, to get support to our industry going forward and she's not stopping now we're not stopping uh, those uh, it's our aim to to keep these programs and change these programs throughout this year because you know as i said during the presentation you know this is a positive time this is a time to be looking forward but we know these economic scars of what's happened over the last two years are going to far out outweigh and uh, outlast this uh, pandemic and we need to make sure that we don't lose anybody in this period now as uh, some politicians think that we uh, we're in recovery and it's it, it's all glory and it's and everything's going to be fine but you know you're absolutely right dave we don't win every battle but i can tell you we certainly don't uh, stop and we don't uh, lick our wounds we just get back up and going again and that's what we're going to keep doing Chris, Jessica, Caitlin, Landon, and all of the team at Tayo, thank you for everything you do for us. Thanks for giving us this hour. You know, you've probably got almost your whole team here with us today. We really appreciate everything you've done for our industry. Thank you, guys.